nearly unbelievable things have happened here. Here, 18% of the world's fresh water supply was threatened with poisons, and few knew of the danger. Here in a vast 95,000 square mile battleground, men waged war on an invader that literally sucked the very life from millions of unsuspecting victims before anyone came to their defense. Here, a few short years after that titanic struggle began, another invader threatened the city of Chicago. The city worked to avoid public panic and hysteria. Soon, the bodies of the dead littered Lake Michigan's shores by the thousands of tons. Science fiction? An Orson Welles-style scare fantasy? For these men, and for the agencies they work for, there is no fantasy in these horror chronicles. Only fact and the realization that this is the nearly unbelievable story of the Great Lakes. The formation of the Great Lakes began millions of years ago. 15,000 years of glacial shaping made them one of this continent's major landscape features. The recorded history of the Great Lakes is but a speck of dust on the face of nature's timepiece. But in those brief few hundred years, By 1800, the Great Lakes began to feel the staggering power of man. Frontiers were pushing westward. In one year, 1832, Chicago's population zoomed from 150 people to 2,000. In four more years, 8,000. Lumber and grain dominated the scene. Copper and iron from the Midwest answered the industrial demands of the nation. Commercial fishing statistics bend the imagination to near breaking. Fishermen in 1840 would have seen only 35,000 barrels of fish taken from the Great Lakes. 45 years later, 10,000 fishermen were taking 100 million pounds of fish from the lakes annually. It was a time of rich harvests that would soon be lost. Man's use of the lakes was rapidly increasing. Waste products from mills and factories were dumped into the lakes without concern. No one worried. The lakes seemed hugely rich and abundant. The largest storage reservoir of fresh water on this planet, their shoreline totals 9,400 miles. And in conjunction with the St. Lawrence River system, they provide a 2,300 mile avenue from central North America to the Atlantic Ocean. This quantity of water spread evenly across the continental United States would create a layer of water nine feet deep. Standing on the lake's shores, experiencing the awesome beauty, the enormity, the promise of untapped resources, it would have been unimaginable that disaster was imminent. It was. By 1900, the Great Lakes were no longer big enough to protect themselves. They were on the verge of a catastrophe that was to show how thoroughly man and the lakes depend upon each other for survival. It all began, the story of the annihilation of the Great Lakes fisheries, back in 1835 in Duffins Creek, a small tributary of Lake Ontario. The first invader was discovered, the sea lamprey. This parasitic denizen of the Atlantic salt water had adapted to the lake's fresh water. 
Further migration to the western lakes was blocked by Niagara Falls. The building of the Welland Canal bypassed that natural barrier. virtually extinct in lakes Michigan and Huron. The sea lamprey had just begun. Almost overnight, they destroyed the lake trout, the burbot, and the commercially important whitefish. Both the sea lamprey and the fishermen wanted the same fish. It was winner take all, and the lamprey won. There was nothing to stop them. Next, the suckers, the rainbow trout. Little of value remained. Only fishermen and fisheries experts seemed concerned. The catastrophe that would turn men's heads was yet to be. Invader number two, the alewife. Commercially undesirable, but now without predators, their numbers increased geometrically until they ruled the lakes. In 1965, we learned our first major ecology lesson from the Great Lakes. Alewives moving into shallow waters to spawn clogged the inlet screens for electrical generating plants and Chicago's fresh water supply in numbers so immense that public awareness of the total situation could likely cause panic, water hoarding, and catastrophe. Two years later, we learned another lesson. Millions of dead alewives infested the shores of Lake Michigan. I remember the tremendous die-off of alewives and the stink of rotting fish on our beaches, but I didn't realize the threat to our water supply. How was our water supply saved? For a few days, it almost wasn't. As many as 450,000 fish per hour were being removed from the intake screens. We recommended a barrier net as a temporary solution. The net worked so well, its use was continued. That, however, was like treating the symptom, not the disease. We had to find a way to reduce the alewife population. I want to know why they, why they let the situation get so bad before they did anything. Until the alewife crisis, which cost industry, municipalities, and recreation an estimated $100 million in 1967 alone, people simply didn't realize how closely tied they were to the Great Lakes fisheries. What was done about it? There had been nothing to inhibit the explosive increase of alewives. Predators had been destroyed by the sea lamprey. The initial problem, the sea lamprey, has been nearly brought under control. The task was awesome. Sea lampreys spawn in the streams during the spring, and each female deposits an average of 65,000 eggs. Our early attempts at control were aimed at preventing the spawning and thereby reproduction. We tried blocking streams first with mechanical devices, and then with electric barriers. In 1958, the use of a selective toxicant, PFM, provided more effective control. Reasonably harmless to other aquatic species, the chemical destroys larval lampreys in the streams. The cost ranges from $1,000 in small streams to nearly $100,000 in large tributaries. That might sound like a pretty heavy fare, but the return on our investment is estimated at well over $20 for every dollar spent. And we've been successful enough to reestablish lake trout populations and to permit the introduction of salmon. As early as 1930, Canadians and Americans were cooperating as investigators on an international fact-finding commission. 
Finally, awakened to the helplessness of the Great Lakes, a convention on Great Lakes fisheries between the United States and Canada was ratified by Congress and signed by President Eisenhower in 1955. The Great Lakes Fisheries Commission was established the next year. The responsibility of the commission and its staff is to formulate and coordinate research and to recommend the appropriate action based on these research findings. They are responsible for the Lamprey Control Program, which is carried out under contract with Canada's Department of Environment and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Both the United States and Canada have established numerous international and interstate commissions, committees, and boards to coordinate management and control of the Great Lakes for the benefit of both countries. The challenges remaining are many. The Great Lakes Basin is the most significant urban and industrial heartland in North America. Its impact on the United States overall economy and general welfare are reflected in the fact that 22% of the country's population lives and works here, producing one quarter of all the nation's manufactured goods. With this intensive urban, industrial, and agricultural development, it is hardly surprising that man-made changes have affected the fish, wildlife, and man himself in the Great Lakes region. Changes in land management practices are occurring. Clean farming, over-fertilization, and massive urbanization, DDT, PCB, Dieldrin, heavy metals, and scores of other chemicals are entering the lakes. Still little is known of the direct or indirect effects of many of them. In the late 1960s, the DDT and Dieldrin residue levels eliminated the commercial market for coho salmon. Even the bald eagles that inhabit the shores of the Great Lakes suffer from pesticides. The decline of wintering canvasbacks on the lower Detroit River and connecting waters is mysteriously dropping faster here than anywhere in the nation. There is a great demand upon resources by fishermen, hunters, and nature enthusiasts. In some cases, the demand has already outstripped the supply. Many changes affecting the aquatic habitat are endangering fish and wildlife. A rapid increase in shore structures, diversion canals, bulkheads, dikes, and docks. Disposal of dredge spoil resulting from channel improvements and harbor maintenance. Land use changes for buildings, roads, airports, and other facilities needed by an ever-increasing population. Use of water and land throughout the Great Lakes Basin, whether public, private, industrial, or municipal, from drainage ditches to channelized rivers, all contributes to the overall problem. The more man depends on the Great Lakes to help him satisfy his needs, the more the Great Lakes depends on man for their survival. If someone were to ask you, what's the single most important accomplishment regarding Great Lakes Fish and Wildlife, what would the answer be? That's pretty obvious, isn't it? The combined effort of us, the Canadians, and a number of different individuals from other state and federal agencies to eliminate the main thrust of the sea lamprey, restock the trout, and... No, that's not quite it. Admittedly, that's a plus, a giant plus. Over four and one half million lake trout annually restocked from only three federal hatcheries in Michigan is pretty impressive, but that's not it. How about the salmon? In Lake Michigan, the state with federal aid stocked six and a half million cohos in the tributaries with excellent success. In 1970, anglers spent over two million angler days in Michigan waters alone and a spectacular fifteen and a half million dollars on their trips. And they caught a lot of fish too. Sure, the recreational fishing, right along with commercial, is coming back strong. Well, we haven't given up on Lake Erie in Ontario. 
And although they are seriously polluted, we're working to get a better species composition in Lake Erie and establish a predator-prey balance in Lake Ontario. In Lake Michigan, the AOI population is one-third as large as during its peak. Although that is a major accomplishment, continued suppression is necessary. You're a lot closer than you think to the answer I'm asking for. In the beginning, we had to work to correct problems created in the past. These problems still exist. However, we have a handle on them. We also have a handle on tomorrow. The single most important accomplishment is that now we are capable of controlling our environment and its modifications by plan and design. This is an effort that must be made, meeting today's challenges before they become tomorrow's insurmountable problems. We must gather more information to adequately manage the fish resources, and we must use all available means to protect fish and wildlife habitat. To realize the goal of protecting the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes Fisheries Research must provide a scientific basis to manage fish stocks, establish allowable harvests, and restore more desirable fish. In determining that basis, they must learn more about distribution and abundance, growth and mortality rates, spawning habits, food habits, and ecological requirements. Even the sea lamprey problem has not left us. Improved control methods must continually be sought. We must also study land and water development projects to measure and evaluate environmental changes. The National Environmental Policy Act requires environmental impact statements for any federally involved action where there is significant environmental effects. Also, U.S. Corps of Engineers construction permits are evaluated in all instances where navigable waters are involved. Review of effluent discharges permits are now required under the Federal Water Quality Act. The Western Lake Erie Estuary Study will evaluate biological productivity and recreational demands. These tools can help us achieve a balanced environment because they allow us to evaluate changes and predict consequences before they occur. Among the forthcoming environmental changes that must be evaluated are power plant radioactivity and thermal discharges, the regulation of water levels that may cause habitat destruction, change in water quality, and alteration of flow patterns, the increasing recreational and commercial navigation and possible winter navigation that may modify water temperature and currents critical to fish and wildlife. We cannot continue to be ignorant of the effects our technology has on us and our environment. Just as the early explorers and settlers used ingenuity and relentless energy, we must use all available means to serve the Great Lakes so they can continue to serve us. By working together, we can achieve a balanced environment for man that ensures the quality and abundance of the Great Lakes fish and wildlife. Today, standing on the water-dazzled shores of the Great Lakes, we have come to realize the interdependency of life that we can destroy or improve. For anything can happen here. What we want to believe most is that this time it will happen right. We must make it right. <laughs>